at rebuilderinabox.com we're about to rebuild the very popular 37 MT this is the 12 volt with the 12 tooth Bendix there are two different types of Bendixes available for the 37 MT the 12 tooth and the 10 tooth if you think you may have a 42 MT, you can differentiate by measuring from the front of the back plate to the back tip of one of the holding bolts. That measurement is two and a half inches. So the measurement right there on a 37 MT is two and a half inches. On the 42 MT, it's going to be almost four inches. On the back of the 37 MT, there are different variations. Some don't have the grounding bolt they're internally grounded and some have the thermal limit switch this is over crank protection so that if the starter is cranked for too long it cuts out this is the sensor it goes down inside of it you'll see it sticking out in this area right here also this externally grounding wire uh, some units have it some units don't we're going to be replacing even the units that don't have that ground wire on it with a solenoid that has a ground wire on it. If you're rebuilding the unit and you, we're going to be sending you the external ground type, it has to be grounded out on one of the bolts. Cut this eyelet, cut this off, put a smaller eyelet off, take that screw out and ground it to the back of the bolt. The first step is to remove the solenoid auxiliary grounding wire first to remove the solenoid hot strap which connects the motor terminal on the solenoid to the motor terminal on the starter when the starter is in crank position those are two E8 socket heads here you can see it removed here's the strap the two bolts what you're going to need is about a 6 inch 3 8 extension and an E8 tool the base of the solenoids is hold on to the intermediate cone with three E8 bolts. You can see two of them here, but it's a triangular shaped bottom of the cylinder. And there's the other one on that side. Those all three need to come out. We're going to use two plain size screwdrivers. Wedge them in on different sides of the solenoid. And then take them and pry backwards to get the solenoid off. Occasionally you run into the plunger is made into the back part of the solenoid so it won't come off. Just bust it loose. You have to take the freeze plug off on the end of it. Just tap it out counterclockwise with a dull screwdriver and a hammer. you'll see the half inch nut down inside it's a neoprene insert so you're going to have to pull back on the plunger or else use an impact gun to get it off there you can see it off it's just an aircraft nut it's not really hard to get off you just have to keep pressure pulling back while you remove it there's the freeze plug and the plunger have been removed for re easy reinstallation, we take a paint stick and mark the front nose cone right where it would be exactly in the middle of the solenoid freeze plug. To remove the set screws that hold the nose cone on, we use this rig. You can use any combination of tools you want. This is a half inch to three eighths adapter, a six inch extension, then we have a 3 8 to quarter inch adapter with a 5 16 socket and at the end is the T40 star bit. The starter has to be clamped from its outside diameter securely in the vise. You'll see six of them around the outside diameter of the nose cone.
Next we're going to remove the half inch bolt that holds the back stud in place. You need a three quarter wrench and I'm cleaning up the threads a little bit before I do because I don't want to strip it on my way back out. Then there's a flat washer and an insulator underneath. The insulator goes next to the housing and the flat washer goes on top of it. Now we're going to remove the four E8 screws that hold the back plate on. Tap around the back side of the plate to get it started coming off. There's a rubber O-ring in there. And it doesn't want to just fall off. But it does come off rather easily. And then we have two insulators that keep the back post centered. We have an insulator that goes at the bottom of the back post and we have a spacer that's on the back of the shaft. This is a metal spacer. You'll see the four brushes here, here, here and here. Two of them, if you have the back post coming out the back, two of them will be hooked to the ground wires and two of them will be hooked to the field wires that go down inside. Take a quarter inch nut driver and remove the four 832 quarter inch head screws that hold all four brushes in. Then this is removable. I will take a pair of needle nose pliers and pull all four brushes out. And the brush holder assembly comes off. You can see the two leads going down into the fields. This is what the brush holder assembly looks like. Some of them will have four insulated and some of them will have two insulated and two ground. If you have the back post you're going to have four insulated. If you have no back post you have two insulated and two ground. Here's a little bit better picture of the brush holder assembly that has two grounded and two insulated which is for the non rear post and the brush holder assembly for the rear post which has four insulated. We need to remove the collar and snap ring. Take a three quarter deep well knock the collar back out of the way. Now we're going to take the snap ring off. All we're really going to use is a small set of channel locks Put one side of the jaws on the end of the shaft push out with it with one finger and then take the other jaw and drag it off. then the stop collar comes off. You can see the cup on the one side of the stop collar and then the flat side on the other side. The flat side goes towards the Bendix and the cup goes towards the snap ring. We have five more screws that are number eight. Here you can see two and there's one on the bottom and two on the other side. Remove those. Ok, 
Okay, now we're going to take a screwdriver and wedge it all the way around the diameter. And as you pull this off, hold the Bendix in one hand and pull it off. Then underneath the Bendix, is the flat washer and we pull the armature out and there's the steel washer the steel washer goes up against the shaft against the armature itself and the insulating washer the thrust washer is a brake washer so that when the Bendix flies back, it doesn't rub against the inside of the housing. We're going to test the field housing for insulation. These windings, these two leads coming up and the motor lead going in, cannot touch ground or the case at any point. We're going to use an ohm meter on 10k ohms, attach one lead to one of the field leads, attach the other lead to anywhere that's grounded by the case. You should have no continuity during that test. We're going to test the armature. The copper commutator should not have any continuity whatsoever with the frame or the shaft. So we're going to check that on 10,000 K ohms. One lead is attached to the shaft the other lead is touching the commutator. During that test you should have zero or very little continuity. Sometimes you'll get a little bit of bleed through on 10,000 K ohms because when you grab the ohm with your fingers you can make the needle move up a little bit. Um, you might be reading just a little bit of dirt or possibly some copper dust left over from the dust that comes off of the brushes. Blow it off and retest and you can tolerate a minimal amount of continuity because you are on 10,000 K ohms. But anything over half scale is definitely unacceptable. Here's a shot of the seal we're going to be removing. We fasten the intermediate into the vise right above the jaws. We're going to use a small pry bar. Just come into the middle of it and pry up. You need to find a tool in your toolbox that's approximately the same diameter as the bushing that's going to be inserted so we can remove the old bushing. We found a uh, half fixed extension that's pretty close. Uh, we also happen to have a 9 16 deep well that's kind of beveled out, 17 millimeter, 3 quarter, something that's going to be just smaller than the OD of that, but big enough to catch to catch the ID. You can also chisel it out with a screwdriver and just chisel a, a straight line down through the side. Here's a shot of the clutch arm, the shift fork fits on the bottom of the Bendix and the plunger goes through this side to pull it, the Bendix out when the solenoid engages. On a 37MT we don't usually have to change these. Uh, we, don't rec we don't send it as part of the kit but you can order it extra and we'll show you how to change it in case you need to. This piece is called a lever housing because it contains what we call the fork or the lever you'll see the rod going through. There's a big side to it and a small side. We're going to take a three eight, we're going to take a quarter inch extension and tap the rod out from the small side. Then the fork comes right out. I want to point out at this point these cross members as you're looking down in go in the top. 
You have to remember that if you do change these, there's an upside down. There's no cross member on that side of it. They go on the top as you're looking down into the housing itself. These have a little bit of wear on them. On the very bottom, we don't recommend changing them until it gets a lot worse than that. If they get a fourth of the way, 25% gone, then go ahead and change them. But we usually don't need to mess with those in this condition. Here we've clamped the armature in a vise. We're going to take a piece of sandpaper and go all the way around and clean it up. Then we're going to clean up the shaft on the top. And we're going to take sandpaper or scotch brite and polish the shaft. Not in a, not in a round direction, but in and out back and forth so that the Bendix has sandpaper marks the way that it travels. And then when we're done, we can put a couple drops of oil on it. If you do have the opportunity to use a lathe, we suggest um, using the tailstock because 42 and 37 MT armatures are heavy enough where you'd need the rear support what we use, recommend instead of cutting, unless the uh, armature commutator is very, very severe, is just a regular file. Then we're going to finish up with some sandpaper. As you near the end of the pro polishing process, you finish off with a piece of the sandpaper or a portion of the sandpaper that has some copper already embedded in it because the glue in the sandpaper impregnates the copper and you don't really want to finish off and leave that glue in the surface of the commutator. It's not a severe case and it's not an absolute um, thing that must be done but you get a lot better results if you finish off with a portion of the sandpaper that already has copper in it. Here's a picture of the kit, what you can expect. A new solenoid, this one's 12 volt. The Bendix, the drive. The plunger, four brushes. Underneath this brush you can see the thrust washer, the cork th thrust washer, some of them are fiber. The three new bushings, the seal, this is a uh, insulator for the field housing. This is the outside insulator for the field housing. These two pieces, uh, not every starter will need. If your bolt, your background bolt, coming out of the back plate is stripped or uh, arced out or ruined, uh, you can get this and the insulator comes with it and also the brush holder assembly. Also the lever arm fork is an optional. Seldom will you need one, but we do have them available. Here we're showing you how to drill holes in the back plate. You may only need two of them, but drill them in approximately that location so that you can use a tool similar to that one to drive the bushing out. Here we're showing you how to drive in the new bushing. We're going to use a half inch extension and then tap it in with a hammer. First set it down in there and tap it just a little bit to get it perfectly straight.
Next it needs to be sized onto the shaft. We put the armature in the vise and put a little bit of oil on the shaft. Then we're going to take a hammer and tap it on and then spin it while tapping on the OD. So you get everything spinning freely. We're going to take a 12 millimeter quarter inch drive and drive out the bushing on the nose cone. Installing the new bushing. By the way, these bushings on the back plate and the nose cone on the 37MT are the same bushing. So it doesn't matter which one you use where. We're going to use the half inch extension to drive this back in. And again we have to break the bushing into the shaft, putting the armature in the vise, put a couple drops of oil on it. Once you get it on there, then we're going to tap. break the bushing in and make sure that everything spins freely. Installing the bushing in the lever housing is a little more challenging. We recommend baking the lever housing in an oven for about a half an hour, about 15 minutes at 350 and we're going to use a 1316 socket Then we're going to install the seal. We're going to use a 15 socket. I'm moving it around. Then for the same manner basically to break in the lever housing bushing, put some, fasten the armature and device, put some oil on it. tap it in place and hit around the outer diameter so that everything has freedom of movement. We have to take these leads here and buff them up with sandpaper or a wire brush and a lot of times this insulator right in here is broken So we have to replace it. You'll see how the copper piece, the copper post sits down into the insulator. So you can see where we've installed the new piece of plastic here. A lot of them break but if you don't break yours then don't bother replacing it because uh, there's no need to. You can see how the wire going across there is tucked behind it and we have to make sure that these copper leads to the each individual field is pushed back away so that the armature doesn't rub it so we take a pair of needle nose and just squeeze them lightly back so that there's room on the inside diameter also there will be some stress on these wires from replacing the insulator make sure that they're pressed back as far as possible out of the way. Then you have to check out one more time with the ohm meter. Put one lead on one of the field leads and the other test lead on ground. There's our reading and we got it on 10,000 K ohms so uh, there's a little bit of reading there but that's perfectly normal. Okay we're ready to start putting it back together. Put the housing in the vise with the copper lead up, the field lead where it comes out the hole, have that at the top, that means you got two copper leads on the side and line up pin at 12 and 6. We're going to stick the armature in, leave the commentator coming out about that far. You'll see 
the two holes and the brush holder assembly those go on the two roll pins this is the rubber grommet that goes on top of the field lead to help you get it in you put a couple drops of oil on it go around and push that down in we're going to put the two spacers on the smaller one goes on the shaft in the front the larger one goes on the shaft in the back and push it all the way down in. Now we're ready to put the four brushes in. Here's a close-up of one of them. We're going to take a pair of needle nose, go behind the brush holder, roll the spring back, and put the brush in. You have to put, there's a right way and a wrong way to put the brush in. The lower part, like this, so that the two wires that come up are facing you so that it lays down and lays on it like that so go ahead and put all four brushes in and make sure that the spring is snapped back up to ride evenly on the groove on the back of the brush okay now we're ready to put some brush screws in the two field leads Go to the two hot brushes. Here's the first one. Take the field lead, lay it down on the brush holder, then lay the brush lead down in, and then put your 832 nut down through. Finish tightening it up. And smash the brush wires down so that they can't touch the inside of the back plate. If you get a little too zealous and strip this out, it's an 832, the screw. You can take a pair of needle nose and hold an 832 nut on the bottom and it's not uncommon that we have to do it here and get it started on the bottom and use the nut as a retainer on the bottom of the 832 brush screw. Here's the other field lead we're going to do next. Lay it down on the brush holder. Lay the brush down. Get your quarter inch 832 started down through there. Hold everything parallel as you finish it and make it nice and snug so that everything is straight just like that. And then take your fingers and mash the leads down so that they can't touch the outer shell. Now we're going to put the ground post assembly on. You'll notice there's a short side and a long side. With the field lead up, the short side goes right underneath it. And the long side goes around to the left hand part looking at the back. Put the field lead on the brush holder first, then lay the brush down and get your screw started. We're torquing this down as tight as we can with our uh, nut driver with a quarter inch lead on it. You can see how this is the ground lead coming out. It's at a 90 degree angle to the brushes, to the brush lead. Then we take the copper leads coming off the brush and mash them down. We flipped it over the same way with the last brush. Lay the ground lead on there first, then the brush lead, Get everything tightened up and if you get a little too zealous everything's a little too tight it has to be very very snug but if you do strip it out you can always put an 832 nut on the bottom there's two field leads coming up to the brush holder assembly 
take a screwdriver and make sure that they're pried back so that the armature can't rub them. Same way on the other side. Now with the motor lead up the top, we have the ground stud coming out the back. Put the square insulator on. Push it down into place. There's a square peg and a square hole. Then we have the two, sometimes you only have one of the internal insulators. And we line this up. Okay, looking down into the back plate, you'll notice an opening here and here. They're 180 degrees apart. Those go onto these two roll pins that are right now at 12 and 6 o'clock. So get that started through there first, the ground post, and then you can feel those roll pins line up and just tap it on lightly. Sometimes there's a little bit of resistance in this o-ring. Take some oil and go all the way around it and that will help it go on easily. Then we take the screws. If you remember there's four of them. What we like to do is take a thin layer of either dielectric grease or white lithium grease and do the threads. It helps it get started and prevents it from corroding into place in any future date. Then we're putting the insulator on first. Flat washer. Put a drop of oil on. Put the new half inch nut. I need a three quarter. And tighten it up. Now we're putting the fork in and the rod. Notice that the cross members, the way it's facing, go up. And there's a small hole and a big hole. You're going to start, of course, on the big hole. Just pop that in. And when you set it far enough down in there, it'll be recessed down in. about that far and we recommend some sort of epoxy down in there to retain it um, even some caulking or silicone RTV just so that it can't weasel its way back out again we're putting the uh, cork thrust washer on it's a peel and stick which is nice because it'll help hold it in place we want to stick it down in lever housing like that set the lever housing down flat on the bench hold the fork up with your finger through the solenoid hole put a generous amount of grease on the two tangs then set the bendix on it set it down in the hole then we're going to guide it onto the shaft now there are five holes that are threaded and five holes in the uh, lever housing and this is exactly how it goes right here you can see the motor lead here it goes just a little bit past it just like that and you'll see the uh, threaded holes and then you can go ahead do yourself a favor, put a little bit of grease on the screws. Get all five of them started and then gradually tighten all five of them up. After you get the screws tightened, at this point you can check it for a spin. Just grab a hold of the Bendix, give it a turn. It's not going to spin really freely, but you want to make sure that there's not a, a huge amount of resistance there and then everything can move without getting bound up. If it gets bound up, you can tap it around a little bit. 
Tap on the back plate a little bit and retighten all of the screws. Now we have to put the stop collar on with the open cup facing out and the snap ring. We're going to use a 14 millimeter socket to hold it on there and tap on it just to get it started. After you get it started, you can use needle nose or channel locks to finish putting it on all the way. Then we're going to use a pair of channel locks to install the stop collar onto the snap ring. Push it to one side of the shaft and snap that side on first. Then you can move it around and it's your choice if you want to grab it from the inside and roll it in. Or you can take it like this and force it the rest of the way in. There you can see it installed all the way in. They'll usually spin pretty free. Now we're going to install the six T40 bolts into the nose cone to hold the nose piece on. There's our line. So we line that up. then get the six started. Now these bolts, the T40 heads, have to be torqued in. So we're using our T40 bit and adapting it up to a half inch drive and we need to go all the way around. And make sure that those are all torqued because you don't want those coming loose and they are subject to a lot of vibration now we're getting ready to put the solenoid plunger in it's going to make things a lot easier to take a little bit of dielectric grease or white lithium grease and go around these seals here so that you can get it in it goes through the hole down inside the lever housing now when you install the nut onto the back of the plunger inside the lever housing, this is an adjustment. The adjustment is what controls the pinion clearance. And pinion clearance is this distance right here in between the bottom of the stop collar and the top of the Bendix. You want it to be right about there. If it's too far back, it doesn't wear correctly and your solenoid might click and not kick in and if it's too far up it wears into the Bendix and wears into the stop collar and the solenoid doesn't properly function so you want to have it set to it's right about there and there's a trick to it the general, the general rule, of thumb, rule of thumb is inside the lever housing you have to hold the back of the plunger with your hand and then with your half inch nut driver or half inch socket tighten the nut down so that the top of the nut is flush with the top of the shaft then continue tightening another one and a half turns and that generally sets the pinion clearance to where it's pretty close back on you'll notice the shorter one and the taller one the taller one is for the battery connectors and the smaller one goes down towards the body of the starter for the motor terminal what we've done so that we can provide you the best solenoid is to drill out the hole on the connector strap to a half inch. A drill press is the easiest way holding on to the other end with a pair of vice grips or you can just clamp it in the vise and drill it out with a hand drill. But the most important thing is we have to very very carefully clean both sides of these terminals because these are high amperage contact points 
and they have to have white lithium grease smeared on all four of these places. We've installed the three quarter twenty bolts that hold the solenoid on and you want to finish tightening them down about three-fourths of the way. But before you tighten them up all the way, we're going to take this quarter twenty that goes down in the field lead and very very meticulously buff everything. Then we have to take a generous amount of white lithium grease or dielectric grease and put it down inside the threads and on the bolt itself particularly in the flange area where it comes in contact with the copper strip. Do not use lock washers for this and do not use any lock washers when you put the half 13 nut on. Do not use any lock washers anywhere where you want contact and where heat could be exposed. So we're going to finish tighten this up and get it tight as you possibly can with about a quarter inch ratchet and then finish tighten the solenoid bolts where it's bolted to the frame. We're going to put a generous amount of white lithium grease or dielectric grease behind the copper connector and in front of it. Then we're going to install the half 13 nut and tighten that down. Then we're going to put the box end of our wrench on, hold it on with our thumb and give the end of the wrench a couple slight taps lightly with a hammer. Now we're going to install the, install the ground wire. It goes on the left hand side terminal. This terminal over here is marked S. Sometimes this will say R on it, sometimes it's not labeled. The one that you put the ground wire on is over here. Then the bottom of the ground wire goes on the half inch stud. If you don't have a half inch stud, take one of these bolts out put a small eyelet on there and then ground it to the frame. This free run test requires a heavy duty truck battery to spin this thing and a heavy duty set of jumper cables. Lay the unit on the ground beside the truck. Clip on the jumper cables. The ground goes in the back. The hot goes on top. Put your foot on it in this area right here. If you need someone else to put a foot on it get an assistant. Make sure that you leave your hands and fingers completely away from this area the whole time that any cables are hooked up to it. We're hooking up a homemade jumper cable to the S terminal as one side. If you have a remote start switch those work really well for this test. Activate the starter by connecting the hot wire to the S terminal. First use a series of short bursts to check for a fast engagement and disengagement of the Bendix. And then when you go to let it run you should achieve a certain RPM that sounds like this one. that the water seal is still in place in the lever housing. Put the freeze plug back in. And give it a couple taps clockwise to set. And we're done.